Oh yeah, I can't remember. There was some saint, and um, someone was talking to him, and they said like. Father, I, I'm I'm really struggling with, um, or elder, I, I'm not sure. Elder, I'm really struggling with reading scripture. I don't understand it. Like, well, when magicians practice magic, they just read words. They don't know what it means, but the power is still there. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and I am of two minds tonight. I have two questions, okay. and we'll figure out which one is better. So the first one is, because I really couldn't settle on one, the first one is, what was a twist in a story in a movie that you felt was really, really well done and you really liked? That's mm -hmm. one. Or? or the second one is, what is like your favorite like I'm uh, not insult, but something to say to someone to kind of get them back in line, like to kind of like, like, I don't know, like not like you idiot or something like that, but like something that you would yell maybe at someone when they were freaking out and you needed them to calm down. You know what I mean? Like kind of maybe something to kind of put them in their place. What are you guys feeling? I'm going to leave it to you. I think the first one's probably... Even though I don't have an answer, I like the first one better. <laughs> yeah, first one might be more. I just wanted to say I really, really, really love the phrase, you forget yourself. That is like my favorite thing to yell at someone when they're like, when I'm working with a belligerent client, I'm like, you forget yourself because it's you like do, you have you gotta, i feel like you have to do it in a shakespearean british accent if you're gonna do that there's one. that temptation but i don't want to you forget up. yourself sir <laughs> because it's like you have forgotten <laughs> there is that and temptation. slap him in the face with a glove <laughs> there's that temptation but it's like you have forgotten who you are in this interaction like you have forgotten your place and i just think it's great so <laughs> the first question it is. So I'm I'll go first to give you guys some time. But yeah. I spoiler alert, by the way, I'm sure this for, is gonna for... turn into a whole thing about M. Night Shyamalan and, and the sixth sense and why yeah. it's no good and I all mean, of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Well, That's I was where actually I, knew it would go. I well, I actually was gonna say Unbreakable. I think Unbreakable is a superior movie. Well, I mean, shocker, it's a comic book movie. But superior, I think superior twist for yeah. I think so. I think so. I agree. Yeah. I think that the sixth sense, it's like it is mind blowing the first time. The first time. The first, the first time, time it's great. And that was one of the joys of my life is my wife had not seen that movie and we were watching it together and like it was being towards the end and I was just like kind of hanging out. I like got my laptop or something and she when they started like revealing that he had been dead, my wife was like, Are you kidding me? I was like, You didn't know the ending to this movie? I thought everybody and so I got to experience that with her for the first time where she actually encountered that. But I do think Unbreakable is the superior movie. So and I think the ending is more mm -hmm. meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I think that um it's I would say not as like it's it's difficult to call. Like I wouldn't see that coming. The same with the sixth sense, but it's more rewarding when all the pieces click into place and everything like that and you realize that mr glasses mm -hmm. and then it sets up a whole dichotomy between like heroes and villains and stuff like that it is is pretty cool so. well and it it you know the sixth sense didn't birth a franchise like it didn't birth multiple movies but when it had been but great, unbreakable did but when it had been great if unbreakable didn't if they had just left it alone if it's just like because probably split, split was cool but they didn't mm -hmm. need to tie that into that universe. So mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, I'm going to go with the others. Nicole, Nicole Kidman. Yeah. Uh, where they're, they're in that. She's in the house with the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, she's been, I, she's been also dead the whole time. They're also dead. The, well, her and the kids are dead. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I did not. I did not see that. I did not see that coming. I'm yeah. going to say. Yeah. I've never seen it. It's, it's oh. yeah. I, th I think it's pretty good. It's well done. It's pretty good. It's yeah. well done. And it's 
genuinely pretty creepy. So. And it's a great looking movie. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? It's a yeah. good looking movie. Yeah, it's it's hard to shoot um, a movie like that's that dark and that it's set up to be dark because she has to always pull the curtains. You know what I mean? Because the kids are allergic to light or whatever. It's I, I, I think it's well done. I, I think, think it and is. I'm a, bi- I'm a big Nicole Kidman fan, so you, you know, I'm, you're not going to go wrong with Nicole Kidman for me. Did you like her performance in Aquaman? <laughs> Or she had just the gigantic she, fin stuck to her back right. the entire she time. She is in Aquaman. Yeah, it's, that, that's that's a shame. That's a waste. That's a waste of her. I talent, mean, yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, of course it is. I think they just want to stick a big fin on Nicole Kidman. Basically. Nicole Fidman. Nicole Fidman. The, wow. Terrible. Anyway, Father, what about you? You got something? Yeah, I'll just go with Unbreakable. Yeah. Unbreakable is great. Yeah. yeah. No problem. You know how M Night Shyamalan pitched that movie? It was. Mm-hmm. What if Superman didn't know he was Superman? Hmm. Yeah. I was okay. like, another layer of cool. Like, yeah. another layer of cool. So, yeah. boy, that guy just stinks on the whole. I just do not like, like, 90% of his movies. But the two he did that I like, I thought were really, really good. Oh, I guess I like I... The Village. Yeah. yeah, Village is great. I mean, I loved it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's probably my favorite uh, M. Night Shyamalan movie. Yeah. I'm not opposed to Lady in the Water either. Lady the Water's not bad. I think it's pretty good. It's not bad. I, Paul Giamatti killed it. Yeah, Water Lady it. Water's not bad. Mm-hmm. I never saw Devil. I wanted to see Devil. Is that the one in the elevator? Yeah. Oh, that's a great movie too. I didn't Is even it? know that was M Night Shyamalan. Yeah, I haven't seen it. So wait, that's an M Night Shyamalan yeah. movie. Yeah. Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah, I want to. I wanted to see that. So that's also got a great twist. Yeah. So. I guess I'll have to go see Devil after the fast and then and then wow. throw that out there. Oh, I did yeah. not know that was him. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only the only <laughs> one I don't the only one I don't like is science. Have you heard the theory that the aliens science are demons? Is great. <laughs> really? Cipri- you like science? I don't like it. Science is great. Cyprian, have I heard have the theory you- that the aliens are demons? Well, the aliens are demons, first off. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, the aliens are demons in that. Sure. Yeah, that's why it's so great. The aliens are demons. I know, but to the most people, you would Speaking say... Speaking of like, which, at some point, we got to talk about the hard push the last two weeks. We oh, got to talk oh, about with that With the UFO, that yeah, the we Vegas, talk, the I mean, Vegas, talk, yeah, the we Mexican talk kid in Vegas. Too. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I, it's, what it's, were they... Like, of course it's... By the way, of course it's Vegas. Yeah. Right? <laughs> area, area 51. I was like, wondering... Is there anything significant to the number 51? Like, is is there like... Is... Six. It adds up to six. I guess that's true. I, that yeah. F- Ooh, that's, that's... yeah. It feels a little bit of a stretch. It's like 35. If you subtract two, it's 33 and there's two. No, but five and one's pretty... Five and one's pretty straight. straight no. Pretty straight yeah. six, right? Okay, so... So here's the here's here's the the weirdness, right? There's the crop circles in like the cement or something. Did you see that? Yeah, that yeah. Oh, the circle in the cement. Yeah, the circle in. I mean, Vegas. Okay, so Area Fifty One. Here's the Area Fifty One thing. The one conspiracy theory that, like, when I was doing my podcast, the one because I do not like conspiracy theories, right? But the one where I was like, I know how this happened because I was in Vegas at the time, was the Vegas shooter, right? The Vegas shooter. And it was because oh, I, I knew that. Yeah. I knew something. And and mind you, notice, they just dropped it. Yeah. We don't know his motive. We don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all ears, by the way, because that's one I never really dug into. I'm all ears. Okay. So here's here's what I tell people before I tell them this, this story and, and what I knew that told me the day that it happened, I was like, here's the, here's what happened. And they will never figure out, you know, you'll never be able to explain this guy shooting out of the window. Right. I said that the day it happened, receipts are there. My so spidey here's, sense here's, is going off right now that my mind is about to be blown. I'm just so saying. here's, here's what I tell everybody. Right. I'm like this. If you were in a neighborhood, right. And a rape had taken place in the neighborhood. Okay. Somebody had had their house broken into and a rape had taken place in the neighborhood, right? And you're going to go investigate. And there is a convicted known rapist that lives next door. Mm -hmm. And nobody goes and even interviews this convicted rapist who lives next door. That should tell you something. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. 
But what should it tell me? It should it should tell you that there's a like an active cover up. Okay. Okay. I right? thought that there's an I active so. that there's an active cover up because that would be the first place that you would I mean any investigator, right? That would be the very first thing that you would investigate. Sure. Right? It would be the first option where you would be like, "No, this is chances are Occam's razor this is what happened." Okay. So, here's what I knew that most people didn't know. OK, about that venue and because I drove past it all the time to go see my clients right at those hotels that were right there. But I had been taken. So the hotels to the. East to the west is the airport. So this thing is in between the airport right there on the next block. I was taken to a hangar uh, of the guy Ernie Moody, who basically it made a. Uh, has all the patents for a video poker. So he's like this multi-billionaire or whatever. He's got his planes there. He has a fully functional Batmobile with a jet engine and real machine guns. Wow. That's amongst really the cool. cars, amongst the cars that he has in this hangar. I would okay? absolutely, if I ever got rich, I would do that. Yo, you, I'm, th I'm thinking about going on that tour and you would have lost it. I Andrew, would've. you would have lost it if you would have seen this car. I would have real working puddle. machine guns and a real jet engine in it, right? And then he has one from the movie as well. Which movie? He's got a, I, 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 one of the, I think maybe the Michael Keaton movie. Oh, you know, that's like a that good one, Batmobile. Right? Anyway. So he's got, he's got that one. And the, so this dude's super, super wealthy. So the guy who was taking me, it's another CEO of a gaming company. He was taking me on this cool tour of this. Then we walk outside and next door, he's like, see that? See all those planes? Like they're like 737s or something like that. Maybe, maybe they're like uh, uh, smaller than that. But they're like unmarked just with a red stripe. And he's like, that's Janet Eyre. I said, well, what is Janet Eyre? He said, well, that is, he said, there were big problems with this here where we're standing at first. They tried to like sue. So Ernie Moody couldn't have this outdoor area and all of this. He said, that is where the people come to be flown to Area 51, the workers who work at Area 51. All those planes are unmarked, right? And Janet stands for like just another something, just another something terminal or something like that. So this is where all the people who work at Area 51, they all have top secret clearance, right? Even the flight attendants, which is important to the story of the guy, have top secret clearance. People come in, it flies out, whatever, they fly back at the end of the day. Okay. So Area 51, weapons testing location, right? That's what they do. They test weapons for the military. That is on the exact opposite side of the concert venue in an exact like triangle of the same angle of the Mandalay Bay Hotel where the shooting was taking place from. Okay, so imagine you have a shooting that takes place, okay? Here's where supposedly it came from, but if you just flipped it horizontally exactly on the map, you wind up in the parking lot of a top secret weapons testing facility and nobody brought it up. It was never brought up huh. Huh. i thought for a second you were going to say that those were the planes that went up to epstein's island no <laughs> i thought for no. sure I was they're, like, they're so, area 51 so was there ever any i mean for instance like autopsies or like the people like did they were they actually killed by bullets see here's i don't know What's kind of crazy is that uh, one, of, one of the things, you'll remember this story that they said across the way, there were these fuel tanks, uh -huh. right? And they, now the fuel tanks are across the street from Janet Air, right? Like there's a little alley that's the driveway to Ernie Moody's hangar. The fuel tanks, Janet Air. Hmm. The FBI went all out. Like you could go back and look at the stories. The, the FBI was investigating these fuel tanks for some reason. They were getting up on top of the fuel tanks. They were looking, they were collecting evidence from over by the fuel tanks. And they were like, oh, yeah, because he shot across and hit these fuel tanks that are this far. And you're like, why are all these people investigating at the fuel tanks? Why are they investigating at the fuel tanks? And it's like, well, what is 20 feet away? Oh, it's a top secret weapons testing uh, facility. It's part of a top secret weapons testing facility where all the people who test top secret weapons come and get and, and go to work where they park their cars to go to I work. I feel like. I just have to say at this point, right now, I have no thoughts of suicide. Like I am a pretty happy yes, person. I I'm like, very happy. You know, 
no suicidal ideations whatsoever. As, a, as am I. That's I'll just leave it at that. And I'll just say, isn't it funny that that never came up? And that, hey, you know what? Just leave this alone. We don't know what his motivation was, but it was definitely him. Whatever questions you have. And this thing never came up. And the other interesting thing about it is all the people who had conspiracy theories about it, they never brought it up. And yet to me, it seems like the most obvious thing that somebody who had any knowledge about what was going on in that area would have brought up. Hmm. Very weird. That's interesting. Very weird. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Wish I'd never heard that. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Mm. The first yep. highly edited episode ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I'll you tell give you the I... question again. Yeah. <laughs> There's your twist. There's your twist. <laughs> uh, um, that's that's it. I'm Andrew, not saying anything what's further your about favorite? it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the one where I survive. That's the one I like. <laughs> But I, I think this is just this this was to this was just to say that like if you want if there's gonna be of course it was that these alien things happened in Las Vegas. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like let's let's just keep in mind what's been going on in Las in the area around Las Vegas for a long yeah, time. Yeah, and, and on top of that, I mean, I'm not the only person who I think would verify this, like it's one of the most demonic places I've ever been to. Uh, can verify that. You know, I mean, it's if it, Vegas is one of those places where if we were to have like rando normie person that kind of like, oh, that's kind of cool, whatever, what you guys talk about. I'm not really sure about all this demon stuff. I'd be like, OK, let's 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 take a drive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and you would you'd be a believer real quick. That's why, and I love him to death, but that's why I I, I kind of look at Elvis with a little bit of a side eye. I'm like, it's just like a little bit of a side eye. Like, a little bit? Well, sure, but we've talked about this before where we're like, I think we all have like a, a love for that dude, and I think that we've talked about like how he definitely got wrapped up in some stuff that mm -hmm. probably he was not prepared for and everything like mm -hmm. that. So... I tend to be kind of soft towards it. I don't really know this fool at all. Like, I have no idea. But just in my mind, I'm just kind of a little bit soft towards him. He got wrapped up in a game he didn't mean to get wrapped up in and all this different stuff. But, like, the fact that he was so instrumental in, like, the revitalization of that place. Am I correct in that? Like, that he was a big part. Am I correct? I don't he, he know. Was, he was part of a – he was part of the – not necessarily revitalization, but like I think solidify. He was a big part of solidifying Vegas into what it is now. Sure, which okay. which is like, well, you know the the whole thing with Vegas is that it's kind of like the second career for, like when you're a star at a young age, and you have a lot of fans at a young age, and then you reach a certain age where it's hitting like nostalgia time then you can go and actually like finish out your career in Vegas. Yeah. You don't want to tour anymore. So you mm -hmm. just, yeah, you just perform every night at this hotel or whatever. Right. But it's, but it's this like breeding ground for pride in a big way, you know, cause like Frank Sinatra was a teen idol. Most people don't know that like the rat pack, the whole thing with them was that they were like teen idols, but most people know them as kind of like the grown old men. Right. But that That's was just because of. that was the gig that they could get. But Frank Sinatra sold like a ton. Of, he was a teen idol. Mm. so it was like that's why people got older and they came out but it's like the same thing for like donnie and marie osmond i think they still have a residency there wow that's been going on for like 15 years or something wow, wow. yeah it's crazy that is crazy it is crazy yeah but it's just but it's just the you know their faces on the the billboards and everything and and outside of vegas people don't really know them but inside of vegas Man, you are just you're rewarded for your pride. You're rewarded for being prideful, mm. like mm. in a in a poisonous way. Mm -hmm. But it's just all about how how prideful could you possibly be putting yourself on? How many billboards can you put yourself on? And so you know? I don't well, we have a topic for tonight and I actually do kind of want to get to it. Let's do but, it. But no, but first, but first, I would say like. 
isn't that and i'm not just picking on like the west coast but isn't that like an east and west coast thing too is just like you 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 have to have like if you're trying to make it in a worldly sense don't you kind of have to like be constantly like hyping yourself up a little bit mm-hmm. like It's just like you're just surrounded by so many cool people. If you want to stand out, you have to like imbibe some kind of pride. I don't know. I don't really want to get too onto this, but but like it seems like that's like the bigger the city, the more emphasis there is on entertainment. It seems like that that's more of a factor, like which is maybe why like I've heard people who have lived on both coasts say it is a little bit more prevalent in L.A. than it is in like New York, where it's like it's like, no, I'm, I'm big. Things are happening for me. I'm I'm doing really well. Like things are good. And like this constant like illusion of success, like it's just like no one. And it's just, you know, I don't know. It's the concepts I heard. But anyway. I'm going to leave it there. I, I think New York is just more like fractured into into little segments yeah. where people know each other inside these segments. And it's people... a lot older. New York is yes. a lot older. And yes. New York was a place not, I mean, entertainment. It's like, you know, you can think about Broadway. You can think about things mm-hmm. like that. But it, it's different. Like California, specifically L.A., was built on That's entertainment. Fine. It was built on vacationing. It was built on you know, expansion, WW2, kind of like after Levitt Town kind of petered out, you know, it's like, it was like the next spot. You had all kinds of things happening. Dust Bowl, Oki's going out there mm-hmm. from Dust Bowl, but in particular Hollywood with films and music industry, and it's like the weather and, and they, like all those things made up California being a place where, you know, that's where you go to make it. But that well, and said, to sacrifice yourself on the altar of pride, because ninety nine percent are just a sacrifice. They're not. They they never make it. Yeah. That's and I've wondered. Yeah, like I've wondered about that, and I've also wondered. I've heard that there's something significant about the name Hollywood. Like Hollywood really? is a wood used in like. Yeah. It seems like Father knows what I'm talking oh. about. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, I don't know. It's yeah. something having to do with magic it's used in magic for something i'm not sure yeah. so i yeah. tried looking into it but you do it jay's got a good jay does a. I mean go to jay for the go to jay on hollywood for that but the psyop with the aliens and getting back to uh vegas and everything um it's interesting that it's vegas and not somewhere else you know i, I find that i find that fascinating yeah. Well, and we will note that Tucker's first episode on Twitter, Aliens, was one of the topics. Oh, um, it was. I haven't seen it. It was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is which. I was like, really? This is what yeah. But Tucker's go? pushed that before, man. I've seen him where he like talks about aliens and stuff, like pushing because they had that through. disclosure, some whistleblower. Yeah. yeah. And Tucker, Tucker was like, "This is the biggest story." Yeah. Why is this not being covered? This is the biggest story of the millennium. We actually yeah. we have but proof that they're actually aliens. It's like, no, you don't. Isn't yeah. that like so like when that, that first started coming out back in like 21 or 22, right? Because the joke was COVID, then Ukraine, then UFOs, then aliens. Then yeah. aliens. So like, you know, let's all just sit around and put on our tinfoil helmets for one second and like talk it's about like the tinfoil episode already. i mean <laughs> this might be our most tinfoily episode yet which is fine that's fine i'm totally down for that like i'm not opposed to that whatsoever i'm a conspiracy realist not a conspiracy right. theorist so oh, there are conspiracies well there have to be it just doesn't make well, sense otherwise well, well I mean, the ephesians, ephesians, 6, <laughs> ephesians yeah. 6 12 says there's a conspiracy yeah speaking of which father who is the high priest uh when Judas was betraying. What's his name? When Judas was um, Caiaphas. Caiaphas. Yeah. Isn't there something about how like his bones or something like that are in like a museum or something like that somewhere? I think about that. I'm okay. About that. Yeah. I, and I kind of was thinking but about. Like, is... Oh, go ahead. Wouldn't that be like one of the most degrading, like things to happen to your body is to like be well, having like, all the like... mummies in the in the museums now? Ex- <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So. Just... There's another reference in there too. There's that great clip. I mean, I don't know if it's a clip actually. I I made a clip out of it, but there's that there's this whole section where Father Peter goes on about like conspiracies and he just bam 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 oh, bam. Oh yeah. Just, 
Yeah, like all the all the. I mean, yeah. Of when you started, when you, you started flipping my pancake over in the middle of 2020, that you sent me that clip, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm starting to see this a little bit. Yeah. Um, but th- that would be a, like the whole Caiaphas thing, like that. That would be, I think, like I can't really think of a whole other than like your bones are found in a pile of like excrement, like a, like a giant public toilet. And that's where your bones are found where there's like, Oh, well this is where they're stashing their dookie and they found like a body in there. I like, mean, but that I, happens to saints too. That happened to St. Longinus. And that's his head but, was found in a, in a um, dung, a dung pile. Yeah. So, I mean, eh, you know, like whatever. in the, I'm sure I've told this story before. I'm sure I have. Forgive me. I'm an old man and I tell my stories over and over again. But at the museum here in Kansas City, there is a original Babylonian, um, like uh, I, have, what, I forget relief. what relief a relief yeah. of like a of like a Nephilim. It's like a Nephilim god. It's like a Nephilim small g god. Like they're right next to a mummy, and then like right over there is and I don't know if this is actually the the finger of Saint John the Baptist of St. John the Forerunner, like in a reliquary. That it's an old on. reliquary. Yeah. It's an old reliquary. And these, <laughs> um, the people in charge of the museum wanted to get like a Native American shaman in there to like cleanse the place of spears, like burn sage. And they were like, oh, this would be a neat slice into, you know, you know, native life or whatever, you know, like this would be neat. And he came back to them after doing his cleansing ceremony. He's like, yeah, this place is really, really messed up. You're going to want to get someone else in here. And like, just like left. He was like, yeah, the whole juju in here is all messed up. And then like, there's like a whole Indian wing, like a whole Hindu wing in there. And it's like anybody who is a little bit spiritual, like, and is oriented towards Christ. I cannot go into that wing. It's messed up. It's It's just like, so, okay. All right. So. Let's do, let's do the topic because I feel like we're getting to the end of that. So we received an email from a person and I sent it to father and father sent it back to the group saying that he would like to cover this. So I'm going to do some mumbling because I haven't edited this email down and it's pretty long, but we're going to start. Um, so I think you, could probably say, just, you could probably just read it all. I think just read it all. And, and I just want to say too, it's good because this is um, someone had sent something similar a couple about a month ago okay all right if you remember and like we were going to talk okay. about it then same okay. same question but it was just different i thought okay let's you know and i meant to look up who sent it the minute i read it you're going to know who your email was and i thank you i thank you for this email i thank you for this question i'm sorry i forgot to look up what your name was i'll you know thank you and whoever you are that sent a similar question about six weeks ago or longer you're also you're also killing it so killing it in a good way um so there's a question i've come across so far that i admit i have difficulty navigating this is a question mostly for father turbo certainly the elephant in the room is that it seems like for the most part it's only predominantly white nations that reparations for past and is demanded of this becomes especially clear when we consider that the biggest slave trade in history was done by the arabs and the turks with huge numbers of white people being sold into slavery from their constant raiding into Europe, but most but most slaves were African. If we're being honest, shouldn't the same demands be made of of, of them, especially for the Tur- uh, especially for the millions the Turks slaughtered at the beginning of the 20th century? Hmm. In America, there are also ethnic other there are also other ethnic groups besides black people who are heavily discriminated against. One of the most infamous cases was people of Asian descent, especially Chinese. Since, on average, they do better in school and are richer, how can repentance be accomplished? Furthermore, will black Americans be also called upon to repent for their targeting of Koreans and the Watts riots or the various hate crimes that have been committed against Asian Americans recently? There's also the problem with just the fact that simply giving people money often doesn't actually help them. We can see this plainly plainly with the lottery, where there are vast majority of winners go bankrupt within a couple of years or with pro sports where they have the same result. This will not fix the endemic and serious problems many black Americans face today. It could have been at least somewhat effective decades ago before these communities self-destructed. But it won't address the spiritual issues that have been brought up. So what should be done then? Also, doesn't the million or so white people who have died in the U.S. Civil War count for something? Isn't their blood reparations enough? Again, if we're being honest, it was white people who ended the slave trade in the Americas, the Middle East, and Africa. 
and the ritual human sacrifices and cannibalism in the Americas too, by the way. In fact, if we took a look at Libya today after the U.S. and French unwisely regime changed to defeat the traditional slave trade was brought back by the locals, which make me skeptical if there were any realistic chance it would have ended any other way. Stolen land in the Americas is also a bit thorny because the natives themselves often stole land from each other. They were not opposed to slavery, war, or genocide, and they are guilty of it as well. Take, for example, Mount Rushmore. Today, it's a part of the U.S. by right of conquest, but before that, it belonged to the Sioux who also had it by right of conquest. They aren't from the Dakotas. They swept down from Canada and single-handedly genocided most of the Crow people and stole their land. So is it the royal path to apologize after taking something someone else stole from yet another group of people? Um, I think that is it. Uh, I, I apologize for sounding cynical. Uh, the conversation has been poisoned deeply by evil spirits. Doesn't mean to be argumentative. And he takes the time to appreciate or he appreciates the time we take to read this and discuss it. Thank you for that very, 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 very well read and very thought out letter. And the one thing I'll say before you guys jump in is um, I have been questioning whether or not like the uh, my dad, who was racist, I will say that just outright did not like black people, has said before that the wrong side won of the Civil War. And he said his justification for it would be that South was that the slavery was already on its way out anyway. Slavery was already becoming kind of like, well, we think that this is actually starting to be kind of messed up that we're doing this. And really what the Civil War was ultimately about was federal government rights versus states rights. And that the woke people at woke historians I have talked to will insist it's about slavery and nothing else. So that's got me questioning whether or not, like, there maybe is something else to this story. Now, that being said, I, for one, am glad that slavery is not around anymore. And I think it's probably a good thing that the North did win. But it is. But it is around. It is. And can and you, I, By the I, way, can you just, before you start, so forgive me, Father, can you just yeah. actually read the question that was asked at the end? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Again, please, like read just the question, because that was a lo long prelude of getting to the question. That Is it the meant. royal path to apologize after taking something someone else stole from yet another group of people? So the question that he's asking is. The, the scenario is some what he's contesting is someone else stole something. From someone. Should I apologize? Is what he's asking. Can we right. get Constantinople back? Should should I should I apologize? Right. It's an that that in and of itself is a really interesting question. So if we're not going to do it as like if we're not going to do it if we're going to be in like individuals if we're going to say what's our own personal responsibility as opposed to couching everything as like collective. You know what I mean? It's yeah, an so interesting I think, I question. Think I just it's great because there's just so many things there, right? And I mean, I think the most beneficial thing too is to really not get into necessarily the individual part of it because that's part of the problem. Is the individualistic aspect of everything is why nothing can move forward in a lot of ways, and the individualistic aspect of how we're all we're all you know conditioned and raised is also why we struggle with these concepts so much. Now. I just want to go back because there's lots of things. First of all, the slave slavery still happens um, everywhere, you know. And I mean, I I agree with most of a lot of what he said in there, or she, whoever they were, about well, what about this? What about that? And I would say that we've kind of maintained that. There's nothing in there that this person said where like um, there was any disagreement. In fact, I think when it's come up, it's uh, we've ne I've never been like. Um, one side of like reparations it, it's interesting because i'm curious as to how or or what in particular um i have person or other people have felt in regards of thinking that you know at least for myself like more of a a, a left a left leaning aspect of it which is is not the case because there's just that's why I liked it so much because I kind of want to go through the points and kind of blow some things up because before I do that, but I do want to say this just for the record, just for the record, 
I would say, and I'll stand by this, I understand that narrative in regards of saying the Civil War wasn't about slavery. It was about federal um, overreach, the war of the aggression, of the Northern aggression. I get all that. But the fact is, is if you look at source documents from Confederate generals and the Confederate, like the, the, the framers of the Confederacy, uh, I mean, slavery is like the core thing. Now, see, you know, it's, but, it, now hold on, hold on. It's not the core thing in the way that people think it is, but it, but it is the core thing. Now, that being said, <clears throat> I would say that, you know, first of all, the way that we approach slavery, we see it, we, we can't help but see it in a postmodern lens, right? So like most people can't get past certain um you know offenses when they think about slavery which is almost impossible to look at it objectively then because for instance the slaves african slaves were sold into slavery by africans you know what i mean and every every nation has has been enslaved again i i go back to the serbs they were enslaved by the turks for 500 years 100 years longer than africans were so I think the thing is, is that you have to understand slavery as in the transatlantic slave trade has been weaponized to really help dismantle certain fundamental precepts of Western American civilization. Now, that being said, the reason why it's been so effective is because there's been nuggets of truth there, right? But and if those nuggets of truth aren't there, then it's not effective, right? Yeah. Like if there weren't nuggets of truth, then there wouldn't be any source of white guilt to manipulate and ultimately, you know, facilitate all of the, the madness that has happened for white and black people. And it's done more harm for black people than it has white people from my perspective. Right. So so I think that's the thing, you know, because um, everything he's everything this person is saying about like what the natives did and, and, you know, the natives and their genocide. It's like, yeah, I mean, that narrative of the natives being all native Americans were docile, peace loving. It's like, you're crazy. Uh, Anyone who thinks that native Americans were docile, peace loving. It's like, you know, it's like, I hear that. And I go like, the Aztecs, the Aztecs were ripping out people's hearts on their temple steps. Like what's funny is I hear that. And I think to myself, like, where do you get that from? But also too, it's like, it's almost like you have um this is going to sound weird but like it's it's a weird worst kind of disrespect to the native people because it's not even i mean it's not even it's not even appreciating their no you know it's again fetishizing like an idealized idea of who that person is and i will say this first off the south will rise again that's what i'm saying i'm going to start off right there one two but in a previous previous episode, you talked about. So, do we say Constantinople will rise again? I mean, <laughs> how about Atlantis? Atlantis, Atlantis will, rise, will again. rise again. That I can't. I have never been more on board with anything you've ever said ever than right now when you said Atlantis will rise again. And I think if we ever get to make more merch, that will definitely should be on there. So I don't know if that's a Father Terrible Ridge, but. The second thing I would say is, is that a couple episodes ago, like 20 or 30 or something, we were talking about the 2020 nonsense. And you said that there was this point of Americans really, really like maybe getting to this point of repenting and asking for genuine like forgiveness. I think maybe that's what some people are responding to now. That's- yeah, so that's so great. So let's get into that, because that's the key thing, because. Again, talking about this, but. I'll just throw this out. If you if you don't if it feels like this is just all, what are you talking about? Read Dostoevsky, read the Optina Optina Elders, and this idea of repentance and national repentance, meaning like people, a, a nation, it's it's fully in the lived tradition of of Orthodoxy. And I'd say this again. It, it was a double trap because Americans don't have a concept of repentance. Um, the Russians were able to repent of their regicide. They knew what to do and to call down, you know, God's blessing, like repentance, national repentance. That's the book of Jonah. The Ninevites did it, right? So national repentance is the thing. Now the, now the question becomes, 
people get upset because they're like, um, I the as if the focus or the only point of national repentance that America should have is the transatlantic slave trade. And I say, no, that's not the case because we dropped an atomic bomb. Yes. Two of them on Japan. Yes. Which was, <laughs> which, happened did be, that. which happened to be, by the way, which happened to be the most Christian slash Catholic region of Japan, by the done, way. Now, the done. other thing I want to say, forgive me. The other thing I want to say too, is we haven't even like reason. touched abortion. Like, I mean, if you want to talk about just sheer body count, you know, getting into abortion now, all that being said, I think the reality is, is that, you know, we're, we are talking about race in the sense of it's, it's that specter, it's a ghost that's haunting everybody all the time. And it haunts, it haunts Christians, especially because of all the things we're talking about, guilt, all this stuff, the manipulation, you know what I mean? And I think if any, if nothing else, the fact that the Log is me surrounding it, the Log is me that's birthed out of it is so, is so powerful that it causes good meaning, good, well-meaning people to slip into rage and all kinds of things. I mean, it, it's, it's a really powerful demon. So not repentance and not national repentance in the sense of white people are all guilty and they need to pay because black people oppressed, not that at all, but rather that people would be freed, that the people who struggle with feeling angry and, you know, I'm just sick of, you know, a minor threat, right? Guilty of being white, like the whole thing, like if nothing else, I think the repentance is there to free people from that because do the, another part of this too was like it's almost like we should chop it up because you read it real fast but like do black people need to repent absolutely <laughs> there's there's i mean uh black people have african americans have more to repent of in, in a lot of ways because of um the disregard for what god was calling us to and for really not only dropping the ball but um defiling intentionally almost in a blasphemous sense the the calling of what god wanted so i think that there's repentance needs to come all around so i i am not sure if this person had thought that um we or i was of the mind of like going along with the narrative of repentance from the white people quite the opposite you know but i think the last thing i'll say too is there's something to be said for leading the way in some regards and that's always the case with repentance is you know, the ones who lead the way are the ones who are the servants of the Lord and and offer up. And it's not about an apology per se. I think that it's about understanding where we have not honored God because the repentance needs to be offered to God, not to the person necessarily you offended. Getting back to, that's why I said in this, and last time we talked about it, it's like David, when David, you know, yeah. said, against you and only you have I sinned, Lord. So, Repentance needs to be offered to God. And that's part of the problem is that it's not about apologizing, you know. Um, and clearly, you know, that's not the case because in 21, you know, into 20 and getting into 21, all the, you know, white people, quote unquote, groveling and this and that. It's like it's only made it worse. It seems it, it's made it worse because it's it's guilt and it's demonic it ha and it's not aimed towards God. Yep. Right. And so that's the key thing is repentance needs to be aimed towards God. So let me just sum this up because people are stuck in a pothole. There's going to be people who didn't hear anything I said because <laughs> they're stuck in a certain phrase. So let's just make it clear. We can pull it apart from there. Everyone needs to repent. African-Americans, quote unquote, white people. And just to be clear, I say African-Americans because we're not talking about Nigerians, Jamaicans, Ethiopians. Right. So. African American, but they, but they have their own repentance for. They have their own their repentance. Nation. Yeah, they have their they own. They have their thing. own repentance. They have their own. Everyone needs to repent. Everyone needs to repent. You know what I mean? Um, because, again, great points. Like what happened to the Chinese, and you know, all along the coast, all on the West Coast, terrible. I mean, every everybody needs to repent. There is no victim in that sense, and that we've talked about this before. That's really so. What's important. tough is. What's tough is, which is fine, it's great, but um, 
what happens is people come in on things and, and it's hard because I'm loath to want to go back on things. I feel like we've covered a lot. Um, just, and not because it's like, oh, I'm above that, but you know, like Andrew was saying earlier, I hate, I hate feeling like that old man who's repeating himself. That's what I worry about. But we've talked about the, the power of the victim and how victimization is inverted and used by, you know, this, by the fallen ones, the principalities and powers you know, and that especially among because, like, you know, leftist politics, let me let me give you this. The thing with le with leftist politics in particular is that um, and I heard this from uh, speaking with an older gentleman this last weekend at Montanica, which was awesome, by the way. Um, and he, thanks he for threw, asking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He, he, he threw this out and it was awesome. But the thing about leftist politics is that it's it focuses on, on the speck in the other's eye and can't see the beam in its other. Cause it's always like, I'm okay. It's this person, this person, this person, this person. So that, that ethos, that spirit is what allows the, the victim quote unquote and victimization to become the weapon that it is. Right. And in particular with race, you got to understand how the strategy works because the, the very real issues that are, that were at the core of you know quote unquote black and brown you know transatlantic slave trade and the broken trees of the native americans those things happened they happened but they're but the way the enemy the way the principalities and powers have weaponized it is by taking those kernels of truth disregarding broader context to the detriment of both those who you know, facilitated the slave trade and those who were in it, those who facilitated the broken treaties and those who had the treaties broken, those kernels of truth are always taken and used to then twist and manipulate and always get people at odds with each other, get people focused on a utopian vision of life, meaning like, if I could just have the world the way I want it and get rid of these people, everything would be okay. This is always always the plan, always the goal. So all of these points that in that letter that were, were touched on, it's like, yeah, there's, there's no disagreement there. The issues become though, what are we talking about? You know, and how are these movements that have real core problems, how are they actually leveraged and manipulated by the evil one? This is uh, like, when I was reading that letter, it really struck me because I had fallen into the trap that I feel like in some ways the writer of that letter may also be like flirting with this trap myself mm. um, when it comes when in terms of repentance and it was in understanding this idea. I mean, because it's right there in Psalm 50, right, that I'm saying multiple times a day in my prayer rule that it's mm -hmm. like against against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil mm -hmm. in, in your sight. Right. And so mm -hmm. because, you know, I was and at what I became famous for was I was a sex worker. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was in this which is to the left, that's a, that's a protected class, right. right? It's one of the, sex workers is one of the protected classes, but it used to really make the leftists angry that I would come and speak because I would say, well, one, because I'm a heterosexual man, right? That's the first thing. So they would always be like, oh yeah, but yeah, sex worker is protected, but you don't get to be protected because you're mm -hmm. like the exception to the rule, right? And I'd be mm -hmm. like, oh, you don't really get to play that game. But then also the reason why it could be a protected class is that, and why you can make it a victim is because then, like on the libertarian side, even on the right, the reason why it was OK for me to have come from that background and still be a thought leader was because because they accept it, too, because it's like a victimless crime mm -hmm. and not even a crime if it's done right. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you have the fig leaf of, oh, no, I'm not a sex worker. I'm an escort. Mm -hmm. You just pay me for my time. And then it's like technically it's actually legal. Right. I could literally do it on TV, which I did. Right. Which is one of these things. And I had walked through life as a materialist with this idea that this exact idea, well, there's no where's the victim. Mm -hmm. Right. Everybody's doing this voluntarily. So because it's voluntary, like I'm not I'm not doing anything that I would need to repent from. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part about it was that when when the reframe came, 
through orthodoxy and through beginning a life of prayer to where I realized, oh, it's actually God that I've sinned against. This weird thing happened to where I actually then started to see, weirdly enough, all of a sudden then I could see what I had, how I had actually victimized people. Mm -hmm. It was this really like weird to where as long as I said, oh, well, who am I victimizing? It's almost that I couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. Like somehow I had blinded myself to my own responsibility mm -hmm. in hurting others because the framework was such that, well, but the framework like, was no purely horizontal. Exactly. And exactly. because once, once you hook up the vertical between you and God, and that's the tradition actually is like, that's why the enemy is so keen on, has no problem with quote unquote ethics and morality because it's all horizontal. Because mm -hmm. if you're hooked on the horizontal, then you can be manipulated through emotion and vainglory because I don't want to seem like a racist. I don't want to seem like a bad guy. I don't want to seem like this and that. And that's, that's how the enemy is like leading everyone, you know, fish hooking them, leading them by the nose. But once you hook up the vertical, you start seeing everything clearly. And that's that's the missing piece is you got to hook up the vertical first, you and God. And then the cross is evident. And, and then the horizontal totally begins to make sense. And that's why getting, you know, kind of like looking far out in regards of like why I'm doing this project, why we do this project, like what what we're talking about. That's why for me, it's, it's like the one I'm the one trick pony I, I've been saying a lot lately is like, I'm just all about, OK, I know people are hooking up their vertical. OK, great. I just want to make sure that people's vertical is actually set up correctly because you can mm -hmm. err there too, mm -hmm. right? Because the Pharisees erred in hooking up the vertical. Because if you hook up the vertical right, then the horizontal becomes really clear too. And mm -hmm. then you have vision to see everything, right? But that's that's where they that's where people get off. That's well, I, I also, you know. In, in, in reading that and what I say, the trap, because I had fallen into this myself in that same context mm -hmm. was, you know, I would also there, there was also this like blind spot or, or rationalization or justification about my role in something in bringing negativity to someone. Mm -hmm. If I could look at them and say, oh, they're a victimizer themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So some of my clients who were like incredibly wealthy and some of them like a, a list names or whatever, who had things about them in their past where they had like victimized other people or done some things. And it's like, well, but they're a victimizer or they're victim, but they're victimizing this person. So why should I apologize before they apologize? Like they're not apologizing. So why should I apologize mm -hmm. and not even apologize? Right. Because again, it's not even about me apologizing. It's about me recognizing and repenting. Mm -hmm. And, and it, so it's like that got, was getting in the way of my repentance. And like, mm -hmm. as I started to read the litany in that letter, I started to see that it's in some ways, it's a litany of like why I shouldn't repent. You know what I mean? Like it could be, it could be taken, not to say that that's what the writer's doing, mm -hmm. but it could be taken as that because I know I had fallen into that trap Myself. Oh, I see. You understand what, what I'm saying? Yeah. So that, it's like, well, like everyone does be, it. And not even everybody does it. Like this person did it. It's like, wait a minute. Oh, so it's you're even You're telling more specific. me that I victimized them like this, but look at their history. Mm -hmm. They victimized a hundred people. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me I should be apologizing and you're not telling them to apologize? Like tell them to apologize first. And But the problem is that it's it's turtles all the way down. Because you can get to that person and that person will tell you that about every person they've victimized. And you get to those people and they'll tell you that about everybody they've victimized. And all the while, it's a rationalization of why nobody's repenting. Right. And so so for me, it was when I threw all that aside. And how did I throw that aside? Because I was like, well, <laughs> the person I sinned against was God. Mm -hmm. And I led people away from God, period, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Right now, regardless of who they were and who they are, I contributed to that. Right. right. And I can't deny. And, and, and then all of these things started to pop up where I could actually see like, oh, yeah, here are actually all of these undeniable times that you've been denying this whole time because you want to rationalize your way out of it. So 
Cyprian, I want to go back and just make sure that I understand yes. what you're saying, because that's that's my role on this podcast is to make sure that the every man can understand. So what you're saying is like there is a certain amount of justification that happens on the whole that like it's OK if we victimize or do violence or in some way call out or marginalize or insult this group of people because they have a history of doing that to other people. So like somehow in some way that justifies it. So and as example, it's, it's not even so much justified because I don't think that the writer of that letter is justifying it. It's more it's more it's more subtle and it's actually much more rational. It's something like, how are you telling me that I should apologize when this person hasn't apologized for the like for the one thing? It's almost like an inversion of the speck and the plank. Right. Sure, it's but... an inversion of it. It's like, how dare you? Uh, mention the speck in my eye without mentioning the plank in my neighbor's eye. Okay, sure. That's, a, that's, but, a, that's an inversion of Christ. But I, of course, yes, 100%. But what I want to make sure, because I'm, maybe I'm not picking up on something and that's right. totally 100, but that's not, I don't think that's what this writer of the letter is saying, of the email is saying. <laughs> I think what the writer is saying is just like, isn't the whole thing kind of silly? Like, isn't it all kind of silly for us to all just be like apologizing for stuff that already happened? But what I think what you're saying is, is that like certain people do use that as a reason to make it OK to marginalize or insult certain groups of people. I'm not sure that that writer. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that. The first thing that I'm saying is that the person to apologize to first is God. God, of course. Right. So it's like so all those other things about shouldn't this person apologize? Shouldn't this person apologize? Shouldn't this person apologize? It's like, yes, they should. Sure. But the fact that they're not apologizing has no bearing on whether or not I need to apologize to God. There you go. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it has no bearing on it. Let me say this because I want to get back to it. And so, Andrew, pull us back because like you're on the right thing. Like, God bless you, Andrew, because we... I'm seeing more and more the need for these things to really be digested. Yeah. Down. So God bless you. This is good. But let me just throw this in. Let me throw some roughage in here to help kind of digest all this very creamy, rich stuff. Right. So man of God, remember when mm. uh, St. Nictadio, oh, that scene, Oof. the two guys, like they're fighting and he's like, they're in this office. He's like, you know what? I have no choice but to punish myself, I'm going to be on a hunger strike, right? That it, That's a little beginning snapshot to kind of get into the, the spirit and the ethos of what I think needs to be re- like put forward here, right? And then once you have that right orientation, all these things, uh, like in, sp- in particular, what Cyprian's kind of getting at, all these things begin to kind of make sense because, again, you have to take a mind what we're talking about. Like, you know that quote from Father from Saint Sarah from Rose about in the last days the trials of the believers will be a psychological nature. The thing about psych, a psychological disposition to things is it it bars you from repentance. Hmm. Hmm. Because if you if you view events of history, if you event if you view current events from a exclusively psychological, which is materialist, right? Psychological perspective is a materialist perspective, right? You can't see repentance because repentance doesn't make sense in a rationalist logic, quote unquote, framework. Because it's not of this world. It's 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 otherworldly. Real repentance, right? It doesn't make sense. That's why, because we get back to like where people, if you if you go back and see how you feel, everyone's this is the trick. This is how you <laughs> rise above. Let's let's play a little, let's do a little kind of experiment, right? Everyone involved in this conversation right now can feel themselves a little bit of ire. I'm sick of being the white guy being told I need to apologize. Or, you know, those or, or like, you know, I'm sick of like not being acknowledged, like as you know, African American, what I went through, the thing I've struggled with. I'm sick of my people, we're dying on the res and blah, blah, blah. However you want to look at it, everyone retreats to their corner 
is up in their feelings and just looking at themselves, not the other person, right? They're not looking at what's going on. That movement right there in of itself is not of the kingdom of heaven. It's not. It's inherently earthly, material. It's inherently humanistic and fallen. Yeah. It's it's me, 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 me. I don't want to be responsible for anything. But here's the thing. If you can't get past that, if you can't get past the reality that we are all culpable, then you don't really understand Orthodox theology. Okay. So I'm sorry, <laughs> Father. I'm, I'm sure you have a really good thought, but this was something I heard from someone not too long ago. And this mm -hmm. is like right repentance right after summer of 2020. We're talking about we're getting into the winter of 2020 mm -hmm. where I was talking to someone. I know someone we love. It's okay. They've changed their mind since then, but they're basically like, I don't see the problem. And they're a, a person in the church. They're like, I basically, I don't see a problem with the person being gay. They're not hurting anyone. And that was one of the first moments where it was like, it clicked of like, I don't know if that's true. Like, I don't know if it's true that what they're doing in the privacy of their own home and stuff like that is not hurting something because actually they're harming the whole of mankind. Mm -hmm. They're actually further perverting the nature of mankind. And like the inverse of that is, I believe St. Anthony the Great says, like, if you choose, I'm paraphrasing, if you choose evil over good, there's just to st statistically speaking more good in the human in human nature than there is bad just statistically speaking if you choose not to flip off the driver who cuts you off mm -hmm. or yell at the lady who you know rammed your cart or whatever in the shopping market like there's statistically more good in the human nature so by you thinking like oh my doing meth never hurt anyone my like my my whatever never my porn addiction doesn't hurt anyone blah 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 because i don't have a wife whatever it's like no actually you are sinning against god and further perverting the human nature. That's it. That's all. Well, I just, I wanna, because... Hold on. I want to please forgive me because that that like I want to, you know, what I had been saying about my former career, I want to and, and I understand that I was being nebulous. I want to give like a concrete example, because this is the this is the one that really came out to me just with repentance. Right. I had very few. And, and I think that it's related to this idea of like because this idea of the victimless crime and me being someone who is in like sex work. So the left says that's a victimless crime. And even the right says victimless crime. And it's like, I had very few clients of mine who explicitly told me that they were married, right? Most of them, they said that they were single, but I did have one who became a regular client who would fly me out to Texas regularly, incredibly beautiful, like smart. Uh, I think she was an MD, all of these things did tell me she was married, did tell me she was having problems, but was still married. Right. And if you would have told me, oh, you're destroying somebody's marriage or doing whatever at the time, probably even if you would have said that to me three years ago, I would have made all kinds of rationalizations about how there's no victim there. Right. Mm -hmm. But on one occasion, she, we, we, we went, she flew me to um, uh, New Orleans. And just by chance, I was down getting a drink in the bar of the hotel that we were staying at. And her husband had hired a private detective, unbeknownst to any of us. And the private detective is sitting next to me. In, in the bar and strikes up a conversation, whatever, gets whatever information, ends up following us around, taking all these pictures. And that's cause for the divorce and this marriage ends, right? And so the thing is, everybody did something bad, right? It's, it's this, people would say, oh, well, she shouldn't have been cheating on her husband with an escort, spending the money that's between the two of them and cheating in this marriage, right? She did that before I was involved. The husband, he should have trusted her. He never should have hired a... a Private detective, that's a lack of trust in all of this. And people would say that's a violation of privacy. He was stalking her, following her around with this private detective, not something that he should have done with his wife, whatever. And all those things contributed. But at the end, and, and I would say up until that time, I would be like, talk to them. Their marriage is over. Mm -hmm. Like, talk to them. Mm -hmm. But on a broader scale, it's like, I don't actually know how many marriages I had a point in ending. It was definitely more than one mm -hmm. because I had hundreds of clients. Yeah. And not even just clients you directly fornicated with. Think about men that you inspired. To on think TV. Like, oh, that's the way to live. Dude, then, millions and, on TV. And the people that I inspire. And they want to now emulate that and they want to go out and destroy things. See, I, here, here's the thing. 
I'll make it. I think I think part of the problem, and by the way, I just want to, every couple of minutes, I'm going to have to throw this out. Uh, writer of the of the letter, God bless you. This is not like, your letter is great. Glad for this. So just, we're yes, just. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You're great. God bless you. Thumbs up. Okay. So anyways, so I'm not interested, like, <laughs> so at Montanica, right? Great conference. My talk was about utopia. Running from you, ex, uh, running from you, escaping utopia and running to paradise. And this thing is, is that we like the bars high is high guys, you know, the bar is really high to be actually a Christian and moralism and ideology and all of these things in the hyper individualism that's couched in Christian Western culture preservation is not christianity it's not so if we are approaching these things like i said earlier from a psychological perspective well yeah it makes sense let me tell you something um if your foe strikes you turn the other cheek that does not make sense it doesn't and we can find all kinds of nice ways and we all do it we're all guilty of it i am we can all do it to kind of like well let me gymnastic what jesus is saying and then, like, try to apply it in a way that fits in my life, where I can, like, kind of get away with killing everybody that's my enemy and still say I'm a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. that That's the problem. So when we hear about all these things like repentance and, like, all the, and that's why the enemy is using all this stuff, because it really calls, and it, the Lord has allowed it to come, because the Lord has allowed Satan, which means accuser, to come and accuse the brethren, because it's like, okay, what? who are you really? Who are you really? Are you really a Christian? Or are you just a Puritan, a Presbyterian, uh, an Eastern Christian? Like whatever category of cultural, moralistic identity. What are you really? Are you following me? Because mm -hmm. the bar is way higher. And that's why this doesn't make sense. Because if you, if you, how I read the letter is, what is the royal path? Is it about apologizing for something someone else did? So first of all, the royal path is not the middle way, meaning like, the, like it, right? It's Christ. So it's not orientated towards the extremes. It's Christ. So the royal path is the thing that is going to be otherworldly. Let me read everyone a little section here from the, um, the Saint, Saint of the, of the prison. Prisons, which all everyone, all of our audience should read this if they haven't, right? So this is about um, a great saint, um, Baru uh, Ganfinicu, uh, who's this incredible Romanian that was arrested. Um, he was arrested, part of a ideological movement, and then she became a saint. And there's a whole thing I'm really boiling down. But but listen to this. This is this is one of his letters. He says, "I fight against sin." The more deeply I delve into myself, the more new sins I find. But with God's help, I overcome them. I've acquired a permanent spiritual serenity, and I am content with the gifts that God gives me, for they are priceless. I confess to you the same thing again. I am experiencing a state of blessedness. I taste it, especially in tears and in pain. There I find it to be sweeter, deeper. I live with the awareness that I am a sinful man. I live in God, the source of all the joys of life. I tell you truly, I am blessed. I understand and I forgive everything. If anyone offends me personally, I forgive him. The mother of God fulfills my prayers. I live as if propelled by true waves of love, which overwhelm my whole being. I am permeated by the awareness of my nothingness on earth. I fall on my knees before the icon, imploring mercy, help, and love for myself and for all those I know, my parents, relatives, friends, benefactors, enemies. I am as you know me. I keep quiet and meditate for hours and days on end. I spin my thoughts far away, and when I wake up to reality, I smile. I sing and I pray. I'm spiritually joyful. By the way, he's in one of the worst prisons ever created by mankind when he's writing this. Uh, daily life is monotonous. My interior life is simple, lively, full and great with longings and dreams I experience and feel vividly in my soul. Now here, 
Here we start getting to the meat. In that most secret corner of my heart, I have found the inexhaustible spring of life, which is love. I realized that I've disregarded this gift. I said then, I have sinned. In the soil of my sins, I have buried the most precious things that God has sown in me. For the spurning of love, that holy gift, I feel responsible for all the sins of my fellow man. At all times and in all places. I'll read that again. I feel responsible for all the sins of my fellow men at all times and in all places. But I am a blessed man, the most blessed man. I feel the love of God at every step. I feel his protection and care for me. I no longer want to live for myself, but for love. And with the great grace of God to contribute to everyone's happiness. May I save my own soul through the salvation of my fellow man. Ah, how blessed I am. How can man, this little creature, endure such happiness? Hmm. There's your bar. Mic drop. There's your bar. And Mic so drop. when we hear those things, we're like, I didn't do it. I didn't own any slaves. I didn't do it. I didn't kill any Indians. I didn't do it. My grandparents were slaves. You owe me a million dollars because I need reparations. Like, just everyone's wrong. <laughs> And that's the problem is everyone's wrong, but we don't want to own it. He says, like, at one point, he's like, I am happy. And that is something you will never hear from people who are demanding, like, a, in a certain spirit, demanding apologies, demanding things to be made right. Or demanding not to apologize. Exactly. We're demanding, We're saying, why should I apologize? Why should I, I apologize? It's it's the same thing. I it's don't mean to always no point, but a different side. I don't mean to always land on the, the left. That's not what I'm saying. Like it's both sides. Right. That's the yes. problem. Yes. The problem is, is that like, if you are, if just this one thing would change, everything would be okay. Mm -hmm. Like if there's this one thing would break away and give, then ev then we could all just move past it and all be happy. And I was just talking. That's so poisonous. But that's that, that that meme, if only that if only meme is the most poisonous. There's I, I don't know that there's a more poisonous thought. Well, that. and that's the problem is, is like, is, you know, when this conversation comes up, it's like, look, the if only does not work on a day to day personal basis. Mm -hmm. It is all about acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. You just have to accept what's happening and like, I still kick and fight this, of course, I still absolutely fight the process in every way that I can. But like, like what we said earlier on another episode, like, father was like, well, Cyprian asked me, he's like, do you like suffering? I'm like, no, I don't like suffering. But the end of that is, is I really, really love where I end up after I suffer. When I am able to get to a place where I'm able to like, look up at the maelstrom above me. And be like, I am so thankful that that happened. And I am so not worthy of anything like any of this grace that's coming on me. That's the best place to be. But it's like people's insistence on staying above the maelstrom. That's the problem. Well, suffering, suffering is inevitable, right? Suff and it's, it's, like and it's just, do you, are you going to choose to, 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 like, to go to the cross now? Or are you going to go? Are, you're going to suffer anyway. I know, right? That's... Much worse. And so it's like, are you just going to delay it and not address it, right? And that's really the that's really the issue is that people want to labor under the idea that the suffering is not inevitable. Well, and if we would just remove these quote unquote barriers, the 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 moral rigidity of the Puritan Western American society that says that men can't wear dresses or that, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. If we could just do away with this, if we right. could just do away with the sexual taboos and mores, if we could just do away with We've this got drag idea. queen story hour. How much better are we? <laughs> you well, know what I mean? <laughs> and, like that's it's there. The, <laughs> and that's the problem is what I would say is, is that like Everything only just gets worse whenever we, whenever not, and I, I don't mean to say acquiesce as though I'm a right guy. I'm on the guy that's saying, well, we gave them this and it's still not working. It's like, no, but every time 
if the acquiesce would bring some form of quote unquote like peace or resolution to the situation, things would be different. But it doesn't. It never, it further just stirs up more problems. It's like the marriage counselor that is continually stoking fire between the men and the women, between the the husband and the wife. It's like, no, but he did do this. And he's like, okay, I apologize. Well then shouldn't we get into why you did this and all this different stuff? And before you know it, the couple will not stop arguing the entire time. I don't know, the, maybe... focus is ex- the focus is external as opposed to internal. That's right? the so the, the whole thing about the, it, if, if this just changed, everything would be better. One thing that you'll notice about anybody who says that is always something that needs to change external of them. Mm-hmm. Not something that needs... Nobody ever says, if I could just... Yeah be a more kind and generous because it's not just if you're oriented that way you wouldn't say if i was just more kind and generous you'd be like i need to be more kind and generous but i also need to be more merciful i also need to be more loving i remember more honest and remember we we had brought that up i was saying that's a common thread with everyone with mental illness they Mm -hmm. externalize everything Mm -hmm. the mentally ill people with personality disorders emotional disorders they externalize everything. That's the common thread. That's the mm-hmm. common thread, right? And so that's why when the fathers talk about the church being the therapy, the true therapy is because the church teaches you how to internalize and to see how you are culpable everywhere. And that's the way to freedom. That's mm-hmm. the cross. That's why it's paradoxical. And that's why people go mad. It that's why Christians go mad. It just because, doesn't make any sense. Because it doesn't make sense if you're if you are carnal. Mm-hmm. The the things the spiritual things do not the the carnal man cannot understand the things of the spirit. And that's the paradox. Like that's why it is only the cross. The cross. I, I just sent you guys the photo of, of it's from this movie put out by Ivron Monastery. It's a great movie, but. The the context for those pictures. I don't know if you could pull them up real quick. I'm gonna so try to. Yeah, I'm gonna try to send them to myself here. Um, see what I can do. But there's this uh, movie. It's a documentary uh, made by the Ivern Monastery, and um, the the spiritual father of the monastery. He has um, <clears throat> a spiritual son, whoever that he has confessed, and he's a prisoner that's been. Um, in isolation, uh, it's not quite solitary confinement, but isolation for like ever. I don't even know how many decades, whatever. Um, but he talks about how, you know, he, I think, I can't remember what he's in there for. It's been a while since I, I saw it, but he's in there for like murder or like stealing. Um, he's been in like, he's been in this one section for like 19 years at, at least. And then some, and then he's, He's been in there for a total of, I'm not sure how long, but um, he's serving a life sentence. And he's starting to discuss about, in the picture you can see he's in this like uh, one man cell. Hold on, I think I can, I think I can pull it up. Hold it, give me one second. I just had to move it, like do a few things of moving it around, but uh, what is going on? Hold on. That is a pretty intense one man cell, if I can say that. That does not look... Like you could even lay down. Let me see if I could pull up both of these here. Can I go side to side on it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, I could. Okay, great. Fantastic. Let me um let me pull it up. So, Father, would you say uh, that maybe the the cross is foolish to those who are perishing? Like, <laughs> would you maybe say that that there is some truth to that? Yeah, I could never say it as good as St. Paul, but <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, so here we go. Can you guys see this? No. There, there we go. go. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this one and uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. He says he's a very happy person. Yeah. He talks about how. Um, what he says, like he he it says. I'm reading this thing. He says how his his character is formed. In the sense says. Um, Take what you want. No one's going to give you anything. That kind of mindset. And he, so he's mm-hmm. serving life. But see that right there? I'm a happy man. I really am. It's harder for you than it is for me. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. he's talking about how he's been liberated by being in there. And he's learned that through practicing the Jesus prayer. 
mm. and and really seeing himself and seeing his state as Adam, right? Mm. So, you know, just just so everyone understands it, let me throw this out because this isn't just because he's a Russian and he's raised in Orthodox soil. And so his soul is predispositioned to understand this. That that helps. But let me tell you a story. Months ago, I was getting an oil change and I'm waiting and a guy's there and it's just like divine appointment. We start talking and guy's Native American. He's on the res and just life had went sideways for him. And he was in Pelican Bay and mm-hmm. Pelican Bay is like, whew, you know, and he yeah. was in the shoe. He's in the shoe in Pelican Bay for a lot of his time there. So he's in, he's in solitary confinement, which is even Pelican Bay. You're already isolated. You're not in general population anyways. So even then he was in what's called the shoe. So like we're talking and he was like, I don't understand why God let me out. Mm. He's like, I had more peace in there. Mm. And now that I'm out, I don't have any, my, I don't have any peace. And I don't understand why God let me out. You know what I mean? He was tortured by being out because he's like, the devil's everywhere. He's hit me on this, on that, and that. And he's like, when I was inside, I had peace. I could understand things. It's like, I, I could feel God. I can't feel God now. You know what I mean? Yeah. I say that because he's a Native American guy. You know what I mean? Um, and knew nothing about orthodoxy. And yet his experience is, I guess well, the best way to put it is, his experience is the untapped potential of what this Russian prisoner is experiencing. So mm-hmm. it's still the same. It, it isn't just because of this guy is a Russian prisoner and orthodoxy is in his blood. It's like, yeah, that's because he... That helped him get to the solution, but the reality of what he's experiencing of the potential of like, we're all connected. I see myself. And more importantly, I'm trying to get at the way out is finding the peace inward. This is what, this is what father Roman Braga, who's another saint said, he he talked about when he was in the Romanian prisons, prisons like Baru, who I just read that quote from, he's like, I was in there for 11 years. I didn't have a pencil. I didn't have a pen. I didn't have paper. I didn't have a book to read. I had a window that well, he had a window that was like nine feet up. That was all he had. And he's like, there's nowhere to go. So where do you go? You have to go inside. inside. Yeah. You have to go inside. And 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 this is the thing. I guess this is like, you know, the last episode, whatever, because I don't got anything else to say now. Like this is <laughs> this is the point. Is that like, guys, you've got to learn this. You've got to get this. You've got to become Christians. We've got to become Christians. We've got to take the teachings of our Lord seriously. We've got to say, I'm reading the lives of the saints every day. I'm praying, go to liturgy, but why am I doing it? If I'm not inching, right? Because it's an inch, right? I'm not there yet either, right? We're all inching towards it. But we've got to be taking the inch step by step of this life of Christ. It isn't everyone else. It isn't the black people's problem. It isn't the white people's problem. It isn't the red person's problem. It isn't the trans alphabet Q problem. It's like really me, myself. And then once you really get that and you start living by it, then all the things that need to happen, they become clear and clarity of action becomes clear because this isn't about quote unquote navel gazing, although navel gazing is great, actually. Um, This is about really understanding how do we get tuned in so that we can hear from God? Because if everyone, if all of us were doing this, the world would be different, period. That's not hyperbole. No. If we were really doing this, all of us, how about this? If 20% of us were doing it. 5%. 5% of us were doing it. 5% is so much. The world would, the world would change. The maybe one, per, maybe, how maybe many half times? a percent. Right. How one many out times? Of 200. The fathers have said, like, how many times the world has been saved from destruction because of one man, exactly. right? So so that's why it's like, yikes, maybe we're not repenting like we think we are. And so I'm like, hey, guys, let's repent. Let, let's let's really get what this looks like because God bless letter person, man or woman, Jason. I don't know who they are. His but name like, is Jason. Jason, yeah. God bless you, Jason, because, like, what your letter is is honest, and that's how lots of people feel, whether they are – Black, white, red, pink, whatever. And that's where we all need to move past it. We all need to get to the the royal path, which is the cross. 
which is Christ, which is the other world. Because let's just say, let's just say it's like, okay, yeah, guess what? Bing, bing, bing. I'm the new leader. I hear what you're saying, everybody. We're tired of being told to be sorry for, for something we didn't do in Makai. Great. Let's get rid of these people who are telling us to be sorry. Now what? Yeah, for real. Okay. Bing, bing, bing. Wakanda forever. We finally, we're going to get rid of all the oppressors, quote unquote, blah, blah, blah. Now what? You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Bing, bing, bing. You know, weird Frank Miller, Nazi mutant, transgender person is like the king and wants to get rid of all the cisgendered people. Mm-hmm. Now what? You, you see what I'm saying? 100%. Father, I've been having these, like, it's been so notable for me of a change to my to myself and i've become i become very conscious of it because you know i have these private groups i have people who are students i have people who who have looked to me in the past or past years for like because i've said things and i'm like oh here's a solution and you know i've been of the jock sort of school of like you know um all all problems are technological or all solutions are technological solutions and everything else is just propaganda right but yet now people will say to me like oh well here's this issue whatever it is could be at the personal level could be at a more societal level and it's like well what what should we do we got to figure out what to do and my first inclination is and i think people are always sick of me saying this is like I, i'm like fast and pray mm-hmm. because and and it's and i'm saying it in like a really real way because mm-hmm. over the last several years like you know i came to this place here with basically like no idea of how me and my family were going to get by, right? Like we had some savings, but there's no software work for me here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I was leaving from California. You know what I mean? And it's like, what are, what are we going to do? How are we going to get by? And it's like the, it feels, this is what came up to me in this idea of like the solitary. It's like, all I had was prayer. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything else. I'm in the middle of the ocean in a place where I know no one, right? I know I do not know the culture. It's the middle of a pandemic. I'm literally, when we touch down, we're literally stuck here. We were in quarantine for 14 days, but then we, afterwards, all the island in and out, everything is shut down, right? I've got a family to take care of in this very difficult time where we've left behind family the whole nine. And it's like, what do you... What is there to, to do? What can I, I had racked my brain. Intellectually, I didn't come up with anything intellectually. The second that I, the second that I surrendered and devoted myself to prayer and was like, okay, this is all I have. I don't have anything else. Then from then it's been taken care of in ways that I couldn't have even imagined. There was, there was this one, and I'm sorry, Sabrina, something you said made me think that there's this one time it had been an especially like rough day or something like that. And I was kind of toying around with the idea <clears throat> of skipping my evening prayer rule or saying a shortened version of it or something like that. And I was getting all those usual, like the go aheads, like the, yeah, you're good. Like that's mm-hmm, okay. You've been mm-hmm. keeping it for a little while now, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're good. And then my sweet little sweet Matrona, my 10 month old baby choked on food. And instantly, like, my first thought was, like, I repent. I'm done. I'm done. Like, no, I'm saying the prayer mm-hmm. roll. And, like, it's not like God did that necessarily. But it's interesting that, like, my first thought, again, was, like, you know, like, when when it gets real and you're not, like, sitting in, like, a comfortable situation, when it gets uncomfortable, you know the only thing to turn to. Like, you know, like, the only thing that actually, like, helps. Because yeah, you like yeah, perform the heim, like scoop the food out of the back of her throat, yeah, blah blah yeah, blah. Course. But like the minute that that happened, I'm not saying God punished me for you know making my daughter choke because I was thinking about skipping my prayer rule. But it was interesting that like I was instantly like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like obviously, like this, this is this still needs to happen. Like like the prayer rule still needs to be done. I still need to move forward. Like this is not something that I can take lightly. I guess it's the situation. Because well, is, is everybody down, better off, including you around you with more or less grace? Well, like, like, like that's the, I mean, that's the thing that it's like the second it's like, and, and that's what it's been for me is that it's like, without this requisite level of grace, 
every time that I have allowed that to, and I can feel when it's falling. Sure. You know, as, as we all can, that it's like every time I get into that zone now, I know that I'm in a dangerous place. You know what I mean? I just know, I just know it regardless of what else is going ar- around. I'm like, Ooh, the chances of things going well is greatly reduced now that I'm in this, this place of reduced where I can feel that the, 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 the grace is somehow not there. And not only that, like, oftentimes like i realize like god is merciful and i'm overdue for a correction and like oftentimes my corrections are like it's like okay this could have been a lot worse like it used to take Mm -hmm. a lot to get my attention like maybe whereas five years ago my baby choking i would have been like oh you know thank god that she didn't choke but this time like literally thank god she didn't choke but this time it was just a little like flick and I was just like, okay, that was really honestly kind of like an act of mercy. Like that, that's all it took for me to be like, Hey, by the way, you know, like the difference is not that you are a better Christian it is that you are more aware of the way that these traps work and you that's are more a strong aware. spiritual principle you're talking about there. Sure. Yeah. Really sure. strong. But like what ultimately what like that, the trap that's being laid there comes from a place of comfort. It comes from a place of being like, no, nah, I'm good. And like that trap is a trap that I'm particularly susceptible to. And that is, I, I forget. I, I had a point to this, but I'm, I, I've lost it. The point is, the point is, is that like, when that happened to me, it really came from a place of like, you know what's up and you're just deviating from that like you know like you stick to your prayer rule like you stick to your prayer rule and you know what's up and all it takes is just this little like to be like okay cool yep and then like not only that but like it used to have to take huge calamities for me to like for me to fall on the knee you know so well well, there's that this is the thing that i've noticed in my if i look back at my life and i look at when i'm but when i've been traveling down a, a path like also what you'll like you're saying it would take those calamities but i think that if you look back you would see that like the calamity was the end of a string of things yeah. that at at any point in that string of things you could have repented oh like at one... any point in that string but you just were like this one happened and you're like no this one happened and you're like no yeah. and it's like now you just you see the first one and you know oh oh this that's is... the beginning you have the feeling that's the beginning and if i let this go that was then, three then weeks I'm ago. Have the calamity. Like that was three weeks ago that the stuff started to go wrong, and I've been fighting it ever since. Like, mm-hmm. so. But but I think but I think Andrew like full circle on this right because I've also noticed this in my own life. Like it's not just necessarily the little things where like the demons are popping out and doing that, but it's also you know somebody says something to me and I get triggered, mm. right and. It's like that in and of itself is also a signal to me. Yeah. A like, be- says that in their big book, if someone offends you, if you're disturbed, that's on you. Like, it's and so, and you. so I think that this goes full, this goes full circle, right? Like if somebody is telling you, regardless of who they are and their political bent, if somebody is telling you, A, you need to apologize for this thing, whether, especially if you didn't do it, right? And it triggers you. And it triggers you to then be like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Like, it, and to go down the path of what aboutism, it's like, but whoa, what, what was it? What was in the trigger though? Yeah. And I think that that's this idea about going, that's a great opportunity to go inside to be like, whoa, why did I, why? Woo. Yeah. Why I am think, I, why am I? Or, so or forgive me. This? Or even it's like today with the guy trying to get at me at the, the store, in the auto store. <laughs> If that kid doesn't make the like, final cut, a dude came at father kind of reckless at a store and he was telling yeah. us about it. I'm not it's sure. A, it's a really weird story. Yeah, it's a yeah, really weird like, story. You know, I mean, a little sidebar, but I didn't, I mean, I didn't intentionally do anything wrong. I had no ill intent towards the guy. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. But he, you know, he came at me and, you know, two steps from showing like he wants to have a physical confrontation with me. And the thing is, is like, you know, I'm just like, Hey, you know, sorry if I blah, 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 whatever, you know, and it just, 
wanted to escalate, wanted to escalate it, mm -hmm. you know? Even when I'm like, hey, I'm not trying to, I literally said, I'm not trying to, I can't remember I, what I said. And he heard, what he heard was, you know, I'm not trying to intimidate you. And he's like, you couldn't intimidate me if you, mm -hmm. even if you tried, which, you know, the point is, is that that residue from that exchange was on me. Mm -hmm. You know, I ate dinner and it was just like, I was feeling it. I was feeling mm -hmm. kind of on edge and I was feeling like, you know, Papadia is saying something to me. I'm like, what, what? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. this, this is a real thing. You know what I mean? This is a real thing, how it can really affect us. Even if you are quote unquote innocent, no one's innocent, but God, you know what I'm saying? But like, there are moments where the devil will provoke and he'll, and he'll do these things. And it's, it's everything I'm, I'm adding on top of what you guys are saying. It's, it's either way we need to be in our hearts we need to live in our hearts because that's the other world. That's the that's the other world. If if it's if I could, I'd like to read this quote from uh, yeah. Saint Sarah from Platina. Um, he says, "Where is it here?" Um, talking about the heart, he says, um, "Concentrated within the physical heart, the noose cries out to the Savior, and such a heart cry born." in pain and desperation yet hoping in god calls down divine grace pain of heart this is what he's saying pain of heart is in in a pain of heart calling out in desperation this is how you call down grace this is what you're i'm, I'm bringing this up to kind of give another example of a father uh who's who's being explicit in what what you're talking about right now this is what we mean by grace because it isn't about just like magic and like like oh if i if i do these prayers x y and z it's not like exchange of like well god has to give me grace because i did these yeah, prayers yeah. you know what i mean that's not what we're talking about just to be clear right it's like but it's this pain of heart and our prayer rules are the drop of water that over time breaks the stone the stony mm -hmm. heart that we have that's why the consistency is important to break down the stone and to get that consolation in our heart that's that's what we're talking about. And once you have that consolation in your heart, then everything hopefully that we're talking about begins to make sense. Because again, just to be clear, if you're hearing in this conversation, oh, Father Turbo sounds really wokey. Oh, Father Turbo sounds like a crazy right wing Trumper. You got to work on your heart because like that's <laughs> they're both wrong. They're both wrong. You know what I mean? Like like. Read the Optina Elders, read uh, the Saint of the Prisons, read Dostoevsky, you know. But more importantly, pray with consistency and with pain of heart. That's the, that's the key thing. And that's what allows us to really see how we can manifest Christ in this world. That's what this, this is about. Such an interesting reframe of the original question, right? The original question being like, is it the royal path to apologize for stealing something that someone else has stole, already stolen from someone else? And it's like, with that from St. Seraphim, with that word from St. Seraphim, it's, it's almost like saying, wait a minute, why would you not want yeah. to go to God in an apologetic mm -hmm. and contrite way? Because that's how you're going to get great. Like, why would you not take every opportunity for contrition? Mm -hmm. Like it's of course, mm -hmm. of course. You, of why course. would you not listen? Listen, let me just say this real quick. And I'm, let me phrase it because I know this is hard for people. I'm not saying this in a in a condescending way. Like I'm, I, I mean this in a charitable sense. Be the good Samaritan. Mm. Don't be the Pharisee. Don't be the Levi who goes on his way. It's like I got my prayer rule to do. I got my whatever to do, right? The Samaritan sees the neighbor on the side of the road and goes about bandaging him up with oil and wine. Christ is the good Samaritan, and Christ is also the one on the side of the road, right? And so when the framework of this question, again, Jason, God bless you. Like, you're awesome. Thanks for the question. But the framework is how most of us think about it, and most of us think about it like Pharisees, like Levites, Yeah. Right? And remember the Pharisees, the, you know, the, the priests and the Levites, right? Like they were the ones who, they were religious, you know what I'm saying? 
it, we we've got to go higher or deeper, however you want to look at it. That this is this is the thing. Don't don't ignore the Samaritan, right? I I think there's a really big temptation, like we talked about last week, um, with reveling, like getting the little bit of like Schadenfreude from like some of the failures that have happened from some of the woker companies and stuff like that. And I think that reveling that Schadenfreude is like is a little bit like you're kind of playing at that game a little bit like it's i think it's okay to be like ah, all right you know yeah cool they're not doing great right now that's cool i'm happy about that but like reveling in it and like it was funny because someone in the comments last week knew exactly who i was talking about right away when i mentioned the youtube channel the guy who's reveling in some of the disney's recent failures he knew right away who i was talking about that spirit is so palpable and it's so like there is no joy or comfort there there is no comfort for like and the comfort that you receive from channels like that, it's not its not the same thing that that saint was talking about being in prison. But I, boy, is know, it addictive. It, it is addictive. You want to keep going back to that well, boy. Like you get, you get in there, you'll get addicted to it. It's outrage porn. So, yes. This, yes. Um, so well, also, it's also the Bible, right? It's also, forgive me, it's also scripture, right? Um, in Proverbs 24, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when yeah. he stumbles, lest the Lord see it, right? This is the thing, lest the Lord mm-hmm. see it and turn his turn away his anger from him, right? And so I know that's a hard one to hear. It's like, I want to be better at it too, right? But what are we going to do? Are we going to act like that's not the scripture? Are we going to ask like, are we going to act like that's not the teaching of our Lord? You oh, know what I mean? Like that's that the thing. whole point of this is what is the teaching of our Lord? Right. Um, It goes on to say, interestingly enough, uh, because this is uh, Proverbs 24, 17. So, again, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Fret not yourself because of evildoers and be not envious of the wicked. Right. And the key thing is envious. Right. Do not like. It's like that old trope of like, don't become the thing that you hate. That's yeah. another way of saying it, you know? Yeah. Or the countless times that someone has approached the saint and been like, I can't wait to see all those atheists and scientists burning in hell. You know, like, I can't wait to see that. Like, I'm very much in the saints like, oh, you have got some work to do. Yeah. Because again, no going on, <laughs> we can even, I love this because it says in the last verse, he says, for the evil man has no future. Uh, the lamp of the wicked would be put out. And and this is one of those things we've all maybe heard it or not, but if you really understood the tortures that await people who have hardened their hearts intentionally against God, you wouldn't, you know, that saying of you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. You know, it's like. I don't think it'll is, be a happy day. It'll be a sad day. It'll yeah, this like- is, this is. And and those who find it as a happy day in that sense, they're not the people of God in that sense. Like when when we hear about rejoicing, we're rejoicing because the Lord triumphs. Yeah. We're not rejoicing because our enemies have fallen. Yeah. There's a difference. There's yeah. a difference. We rejoice because the, the Lord triumphs. But you know? kind of probably wishing a little bit that everyone were rejoicing too. Like, I mean, I don't know. I'll probably be like, I wish more people would be cool with this. But okay. Well, I mean, just just from a practical standpoint, it's like, you know, if you're happy, you know, if you're like, I can't wait to see these people burning in hell. I mean, there's a presupposition there, right? That it's like that you're well, not they made, be one of them. Well, no, they made it their whole life. And they the, the way that they were acting throughout their whole life was such that they would burn in hell, which means that actually they spent their whole life making the world a worse place for you and yours. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Less a less holy place. Rather than saying, oh, man, I would I, I, I would love and I would be so ecstatic if if these people were repenting and if they were saved, because that would necessarily mean that they had gone, that they had at some point in their life started to make it better for you and yours. Yeah, because a person who wishes repentance and prays for repentance of their enemies, they're doing the work of the Lord. Yeah. And, and that's the person who truly loves the world and, and wants to have a better life. But if you're like the other way around, you're just... Not only are you bringing more evil into the world, right? But you're at the very least keeping it status quo. And it's like, no, man, like there, that doesn't work in the spiritual life, right? Uh-huh. So 
That's very that's very um non cohesive because you're you're very much like putting yourself in the place of you know exactly what is right and what is wrong and like there's that um story of the priest who's saint nikolai tells this story the priest who's walking along and a guy jumps out with a sword or a gun i don't remember like let's say it's a sword and says i'm going to kill you priest and it's like I've, I've killed 99 people and you're going to be the hundredth and um the priest said okay that's fine could you go get me a glass of water real quick before you kill me and the guy's like uh yeah sure i guess and walks and gets a glass of water on his way back with the water has a heart attack falls down and dies Mm -hmm. the soul soul is being taken to the the demons and angels are arguing about what to do with the soul the angel says no he confessed the demons like the soul's ours he murdered a ton of people but the angel said no he confessed to a priest and then offered to get him water (laughs) like he's going to heaven (laughs) like he's good so like that's we good. should just <laughs> hope great. that That's mercy is available to all of us. We should just hope that 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 is like what is that Dostoevsky story where the old grumpy lady throws the onion at the homeless guy and yeah. she is being pulled out of hell with the onion. Yeah. But then when people are grabbing onto her, she starts fighting them off. And then the demons are like, well, we got her. And the angels like, yeah, you can have her. She's fine. Like she's obviously not learned anything. So we're at two hours. And one of the things this is going to be the quote episode um but one of of the things yeah i got another one yesterday in the prologue uh constantine the fall of constantinople maybe yeah the fall of the city of constantinople was commemorated in 1453 sultan muhammad ii conquered constantinople and executed uh emperor constantine the 11th mamet (laughs) mamet 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 oh sorry yeah so apologies hymn of praise for the fall of the city of constantinople so this is by saint nikolai velimirovich constantine the emperor bravely defends constantinople and i'm sorry i think there's a through line here i I think it's important and i think that everyone will pick up on it i think they will constantine the emperor bravely defends constantinople and to god he quietly prays within himself O most high god Who from heaven looks down, you do not allow injustice to defeat justice. Christians against you have greatly sinned, and upon your laws have trampled horridly. Without your permission, the battle is not. Because of men's sins, blood is shed, that this city fall, that this city fall, if it is your will. Not to surrender, encourage my people, that the cross might not be trampled upon, and that they do not go over to Islam. Rather, let them endure bondage until freedom returns. Let them servants be, let them be servants, let them even be slaves. Upon them let hatred and ridicule fall, but with hope and repentance let them endure, and with bitter sighing for former sins, until all their sins they wash away and and expiate. I think that's, yeah. And until you, and, 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 and until to you they completely return, if they have you, they will be rich. All plundered treasures you will replace. Constantinople, may it be or not be i love that line like may it be or may not be constantinople in heaven a constantinople in heaven you have established where with your servants you gloriously reign before this constantinople behold i stand O blessed one on our sinful souls have mercy when it is built anew let the old one be raised and i think that the through line there is that this is very very tempting to look at the fall of constantinople from what i'm seeing from this materialist perspective it was the bastion of christianity the heart of christianity and god still let it fall and what saint nikolai i think is talking about there through constantine the 11th is like yeah let it fall like all of this stuff is because of stuff we have done it's very tempting to look out at muslim at islams and be like those bastards you know like they came and they took constantinople from us it's like no god let that happen you guys were spoiled brats just like me but you guys were spoiled brats and you have been trampling upon the precepts of god for generations it's not like god was like oh i turned my back for a second and constantinople fell oh well i guess we got to move to russia now like the neighborhood there goes the neighborhood like he very much let this thing fall and from what saint nikolai is saying constantine the 11th is like yeah let it fall you've already got one in heaven it's not a huge deal like let it fall yeah that's it that's all i got to say about that so so are we going around with quotes is that we brought that up 
What? I don't have a quote. <laughs> yeah, I like you're sharing quotes. Is that what you brought it up for? Like you're like, oh, me? Are you talking to me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I... Was that the end of the episode? Yeah, it was the end of is the. Is that episode. like you bring up a quote instead of a question? Is that is that? What oh, that, is that what we did? Like, is that like, what we're, doing? we're on the same page. We're on the same page now. Yeah, I kind of thought that'd be a cool way to close the episode. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> because yeah it, because it was just a neat way of like saying like yeah like Actually, i said it's can it's, i can i kind of one up you on this one someone said it. someone said this to me today and and i just figured they sent it today providentially because i think you're i think i think this will be another good what you call it through line sure once a protestant pastor found a reverend and pious russian priest and told him we do charity work we build old age homes, orphanages, halls, hospitals. We also organize pop rock concerts and thus the stadiums are filled with young people. Furthermore, we go on excursions, do mountain climbing, tourism. We even interfere in our country and nation's political life. We are alive and active. What do you do? Of course, the Russian priest could also answer that the church does charity work and is socially active as well as starting from the Vasilidia up to the so many deeds that every holy metropolis fulfills silently. But he did not respond in this manner. When he was asked, and what do you do? He answered in a different way. What is it we do? We do the divine liturgy. And mm -hmm. through divine worship, paradise is filled for free and hell is emptied. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Hmm. Mic drop. Mic drop. Like mm -hmm. also the mic drop episode. <laughs> For real. <laughs> when you're quoting Orthodox saints who are there, there's just always gonna be a mic drop. Your gods are mm -hmm. demons. Like yeah. I love that. Your gods are yeah. demons. Yeah. And yeah, that's a whole thing. So okay. Thank you for joining us. Um well, how do I end the show? Um, contact, contact email. Okay, contact. Yeah, if you're looking to reach out, people, people, couple people are still reaching out to me. That's great, fantastic. Keep it up, Andrew at RoyalPath.network. There's also for more broad questions that don't necessarily want to go through me because I take a long time to respond to people, and I apologize for that. But it's contact at RoyalPath.network. It's um, I got a volunteer to take care of it. She is on it. Um. Besides that, uh, we have a merch store, royalpath.store. Um, there's merch for sale there. We don't see any of that money. Two-thirds of it goes to the church. Atlantis will rise again. Shirt Atlantis. Soon. <laughs> I, oh Shirt's my, coming soon. I would buy that. I would buy it myself. I would pay full price and everything. Um, the, we don't see any of that money. Two thirds of it goes to the parish. One third of it goes to the person who makes the merchandise. Uh, anytime we mention uh, a song or an artist, I generally try and throw them on a playlist. Uh, white minority is that the name of the uh, minor threat song? White guilt. Yeah. yeah white, white minority. Guilt. Yeah. White. Mi no, I think white minority is black flag. I oh, think it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah. um, for, oh, hold on. Hold on. I don't want to get my guilty, guilty being white. Guilty being white. Thank guilty you. Guilty being I white. I want to get my card pulled. Yeah. Both of those are going to definitely make it onto the playlist. Um, and then um, I think I th uh, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.